Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Andres Jaque. I'm, I'm the director of the Advanced Architectural Design Program here at Columbia University Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation. And we're incredibly honored to, to be welcoming uh, John Jonas uh, to this auditorium here today. Uh, surprisingly, John uh, is not aware of the huge influence that uh, her work has uh, in architecture, and I would say in, in culture at large at this point, and not only culture, as she's uh, been connecting uh, different disciplines, science, art, uh, politics, through her entire career. And, uh, and this is for us a very, very unique moment. Uh, this is something that uh, Celsi Chen has been organizing uh, and making possible together with, the, the, with John Jonas' team that has been also incredibly generous. Um, John Jonas is going to be introduced today but by Samuel Stewart Halevy, uh, who's here, uh, that will also be moderating uh, the Q&A after John's uh, presentation. And uh, he will be, Sam will be joined by David Moon uh, in uh, responding to John Jonas and moderating the debate with the entire auditorium. Uh, and Jor Jordan Carver and uh, Ashraf Abdallah will be supporting uh, Sam, uh, John, and, and David in the Q&A. Uh, before we start, I would like to acknowledge that today we gather in Lenape Hawking, uh, Lenape land, uh, the unceded ancestral homeland of the Lenape peoples. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Lenape community, their traditional territory, elders, ancestors, and future generations uh, not only as, in, as a history, but something that remains and a number of realities that keep being um, uh, suffering violence. And acknowledging that as a school, Columbia, like New York and the United States as a nation, has founded upon the exclusions and erasures of indigenous peoples. GSAP and the AAD program are committed to addressing the deep history of erasure, of indigenous knowledge in architecture, and in the Western tradition of architectural education specifically. With this, GSAP commits to confronting these institutional legacies as agents of colonialism and to honoring indigenous knowledge in its curricula, something that, of course, is uh, directly related to what we do or we, we, uh, and, and, the, the, and also the, the, what we uh, need to undo. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to, to pass it to, to Sam. Um, thank you, Andres. Um, I'm very happy to welcome Joan Jonas to Colombia today, uh, or I should say, uh, actually back to Colombia, where you were once a graduate student like so many of us um, in this room. Today, Joan Jonas is a world-renowned artist whose work crosses a wide variety of media, including video, sound, uh, text, and sculpture, all of which are connected through her singular practice of drawing. Her early performances and installations have been crucial to the development of many um, contemporary art genres and practices today, and also, I think, seem uncannily prescient. Uh, we need only to recall the past two years of trying to negotiate telepresence uh, in the time of the pandemic to think back to Joan's early closed circuit experiments and televisual feedback um, from the late 1960s and early 70s. And while Joan is often celebrated as a pioneer of these forms, her work is also intensely collaborative. Uh, it is often produced with fellow artists, uh, dancers, composers, children, and since 2014, um, marine biologists, sedimentologists, uh, cephalopods, and sea squirts. Um, as her exhibitions and performances have increasingly taken up themes of environmental degradation, um, extinction, and interspecies uh, communication. So I'm not going to try to represent um, the many attempts that uh, have been made to find a kind of single line through this heterogeneous and complex body of work, which she time and again revises and repurposes towards new ends. Uh, because we're about to hear from Joan herself about the narrative of her artistic practice. Um, but I would like to recount a few of her many accomplishments and sites in which her work has been recognized uh, and exhibited since the late 1960s. These include her frequent participation in 
um, Documenta in Kassel, where she's been a part of six editions uh, of the exhibition between 1972 and 2012. Um, her work was also the subject of a major retrospective at the Tate Modern in London in 2018. Uh, and she has presented numerous exhibitions, including at the Malmo Kunsthall in Malmo, Sweden, the Pirelli in 2015, the Pirelli Hangar Bicocca in Milan in 2014, the Queen's Museum of Art in New York in 2003, the Staatsgalerie in Stuttgart in 2000, the Stedelijk Museum Amsterdam in 1994, and the University Art Museum Berkeley um, in 1980. In addition to Documenta, she has been a frequent participant in biennials, uh, including uh, tai the Taipei Biennial in 2014, the Venice Biennale in 2009, the Biennale of Sydney in 2008, the Yokohama Triennale in 2008, um, and the Sao Paulo Biennial in 2008. In 2015, Joan represented the United States uh, at the 56th Venice Biennale. Her many solo shows include the NTU Center for Contemporary Art Singapore in 2016, uh, the DHC Art Foundation for Contemporary Art Montreal in 2016, uh, the CCA Wattest Institute San Francisco in 2014, and Les Plateaux and Jeux de Pomme uh, Paris in 2005. In 2018, she was awarded the prestigious Kyoto Prize uh, presented to, the, to those who have contributed significantly to the scientific, cultural, and spiritual betterment of humankind. She has just completed a, por a performance at the Park Avenue Armory uh, in April and is presently preparing for future exhibitions uh, at Munich's Haus der Kunst uh, and a retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 2026. She's also currently Professor Emerita at MIT's Program in Art, Culture, and Technology, uh, and is the author of reference texts on the, perform the performance arts. She has lived and worked uh, in Soho in New York since 1968. Um, and we're so happy that she came uptown today to be with us. So please welcome me and join in uh, Please join me in welcoming Joan Jonas to Columbia, GSAP, and the Arguments Lecture Series. Thank you. I'm so um, honored to be here and to return to Columbia after how many years? Like 65? How many years is that? <laughs> but I, I'll just tell you that the art school was in the rotunda of the library. When I went, when I came here, so bear with me while I read my uh, lecture. I'm going to make it a little bigger. Okay. Um, so growing up, I spent summers in New Hampshire with friends. With friends, I would put on amateur theater performances, and I spent a lot of time in the woods and the fields that surround the house. I had a dog named Cindy. I've had dogs all my life, and they've become a part of my work. Winters, we lived in New York City, and as a child, I went to the Metropolitan Museum and the Museum of Modern Art. I attended five different schools before college. This continuous displacement led to the forming of an outsider's life view. My memory is that, okay, this is a new place. I have to adjust each time. Each project is a new experience. In graduate school at Columbia, I studied early 20th century poetry, which greatly affected the way I think about the structure of a work. The form of the haiku was very important to the imagist poets, who were a major influence on me. Metaphor is an aspect of my visual language. How does one tell a story with sound and image in time? What is the function of an image? Inspiring, inspired by modern, oh, inspiring modernist poetry, the structure of the haiku can combine two images to make a third. Or like Ezra Pound's In the Station of a Metro from 1913, the apparition of these faces in a crowd petals on a wet black bow. When I began to work in time-based media, 
I had to invent ways of structuring sequences of images, so I worked with the language of montage in composing my work. My earliest influences were magic shows, in addition to the circus and Broadway musicals, and of course, television and movies, as well as an indirect exposure to the art world. Through family, I became aware of the contemporary art circles of New York. In university at Mount Holyoke College, my studies were in art history, literature, and sculpture. I then went to art school in Boston and continued with sculpture while concentrating on drawing, drawing being a basic element of my work. When I switched from sculpture to performance in the mid-60s, I had to think about this new form and consider how to work with it in order to develop a language of my own. I made this statement at the time. I, don't, I didn't see a major difference between a poem, a sculpture, a film, or a dance. A gesture has, for me, the same weight as a drawing. Draw, erase, draw, erase, memory, erased. While I was studying art history, I looked carefully at the space of paintings, films, and sculpture, how illusions are created within a frame space, and how to deal with a real physical space with depth and distance. When planning or developing a performance, I just went to a space and looked at it. I would imagine how it would look to an audience, what they would be looking at, and how they would perceive choreographed movement of figures in the ambiguities and illusions of the space. An idea of a piece would come just from looking until my vision blurred. I would also begin with a prop, such as a mirror, a cone, a TV, or a narrative, a story. Sassetta and Piera della Francesca are two Renaissance paintings, Renaissance painters that I really loved. I was interested in the geometric forms and how the space of architecture was depicted in the space of the city. In Sassetta, I was drawn to the form, the delicate colors, the magic. In the, ma the magic in Piero, it was the placement of figures in the space of architecture, how they stood and seemed to float just off the ground while beginning to gesture. A direct influence was Alberto Giacometti. His figures, sometimes tiny, sometimes enormous, occupied and commanded a focused space. The figures are in bronze. The idea of alchemy in the transformation of material is essential. From the very beginning, nature has been a context for my work. Since childhood, I have loved the outdoors, playing in the woods in New Hampshire, putting on plays with my friends in various wild gardens, and watching thunderstorms move across the valleys. These were high points. The first time I really understood why people made up stories about gods was when I went to the southwest of the US and saw the landscape there. It was so overwhelming in an unexplainable way that I understood why it had to be explained by myths and stories. When I made Wind in 1968, it was filmed outdoors on the coldest day of the years, though it was based on an indoor piece. The wind became a character and a force. The wind turned what could have been familiar everyday movements into a comedy of chaos. Forces of nature and the landscape continue to be a major presence. I studied the structure of film, modernist poetry, and literature while figuring out how to tell a condensed and fragmented story. I learned so much from looking at the early films of Vertov, Eisenstein, Podovkin, Ozu, and others. I was drawn to the effect of one, in, one image next to another, and in a related way, to the use of a series of close-ups to build a narrative. I was affected by the use of landscape and the contrasting close-ups of animals, flowers, children, and people. The Russians, like other early filmmakers, were attracted to the activities of everyday movement. After seeing silent films, one was more aware of how sound could be used in a particular way. When I was in high school during the 50s in Northport, Long Island, I saw my first Japanese film. It was called Ugetsu by Kenji Mizoguchi, and it intrigued and startled me at the same time. I was taken aback by the style of acting and its imagery. I had never seen anything like it. Later, after formal studies, I continued my study of film by attending film screenings in New York at many places, but concentrated viewings at the anthology of film archives, which was established by Jonas Mikas. 
When I began to work in time-based media, I had to invent ways of structuring sequences of images. So I worked with a language of montage in composing performance, film, and video works. Filmic te techniques included the cut, the edit, the fade, the double exposure, the manipulation of light and dark, and so on. When working with video, I thought, what is peculiar to video, and how do film and video overlap as technologies? In the 1960s, when I knew I wanted to make performance-based work, I attended dance workshops, performances, and happenings by visual artists and dancers in New York, such as Klaus Oldenburg, Yvonne Rayner, Simone Forti, Deborah Hay, Robert Rauschenberg, and Tricia Brown, and others. I was also looking at how art is a dialogue with the past and with the future. I am a collector, constantly looking for both familiar and strange objects in flea markets, at home and away, that might become props in my work. I often do not know exactly how I might use something until standing with it in the space of performance. The objects I use are not literal adaptations of the elements in the story or concept, but are symbolic or archetypal. For example, a prop that I have continuously constructed out of paper or tin, the actuality of the form, the cone, was an instrument to channel sound to the audience. I could whisper in their ears, look through it, listen to it, yell through it, sing, always directing sound to a place. Funnel a piece I did in 1974 was based on the form of a cone. I made many paper cones of different sizes and proportions. I started working with nine foot tin cones in 76 and continue to be inspired by this shape. My inspiration also includes travel, collecting objects, and the study and research into practices of other cultures and their rituals. Ritual is part of my language, my own ritual. While inspired by others, I do not copy them. In some cases, I've borrowed, but very little. In studying art history, every painting has a story, and many practices began in ritual. The no theater began as ritual. I have always been interested in the early periods of art, as the Minoan and the Mycenaean period. I spent a year in Greece in the 60s, including several months in Crete, because I was drawn to the Minoan myths of women diving into the sea with dolphins. In the 1960s, when I was doing research and getting prepared to go into performance, I saw the Hopi snake dance in the Southwest. It was amazing, outdoors, and beautiful. All of these ideas have continued through the years and have been applied in different ways to later work, not the Hopi snake dance, I have to say. They have to do with my way of performing, my way of disguising myself and working in relation to the camera. How to alter the image through the various media and then, after recording, alter later through editing, using layering devices and reflection to alter how the audience perceives what they see. A method of layering becomes a basic way of building and conceiving. Simultaneously, I have continuously stepped from the making of a performance to making autonomous films and video works and back to installation and then back to the other forms while moving images and ideas from each to the other. The first prop that I used was the mirror. And as you saw on wind, we had costumes with mirrors pasted onto them. I was inspired by the short stories of the Argentinian writer Jorge Luis Borges. I was very intrigued by how he wrote about mirrors and space and the infinite multiplication of architectural elements to form a library. The endless library that went on and on. So I made several performances with mirrors in the late 1960s. These pieces continued, consisted of a group of about 17 people walking very slowly while very carefully moving in choreographed movements in the space. The mirrors faced the audience. In turn, the audience saw the reflected fractured space, the other performers, and themselves. 
So what you're seeing now is a recent reconstruction from notes and photographs of mirror piece one and two, which was originally performed in the late 60s and early 70s. The mirror was a metaphor for me, a device to alter the image and to include the audience as reflection, making them uneasy as they view themselves in public. The fragility of the mirrors and glass that could actually break and also cause discomfort. Inclusion of sub such abstract content pervades my work with or without the logic of the story. Beauty with an offsetting edge. Other outdoor pieces also involved the viewpoint of the audience. Following the mirror works, my early work developed in a particular concept and place. In the 1960s, some parts of New York looked like ruins. Parts of the Lower West Side, for example, and the docks nearby along the Hudson River. These were places to explore. Is there sound with the video? With sound, really, yeah. And is it showing now? No, it's a little later. OK, sorry. <laughs> the first outdoor piece, Jones Beach piece, in 1970, was about perception in the distance. How sound is delayed by distance. One sees the action, and split seconds later, one hears the sound. Space is flattened by the distance. Certainly, one can relate to it, relate it to the history of painting and representation of flatness and the idea of trying to create the illusion of depth through perspective or color and form and placement of figures, buildings, and so on. I went to Japan in 1970 and saw the No Theater. It had a significant influence on me and my work. It was then that I started experimenting with masks and used them in the outdoor works. Masks hid my face from the audience and gave me another persona. They inspire me to move in a different way, behave in a different way, and they mask my personality, which I like. The sound of wood hitting wood in the no inspired me to work with wood blocks, clapping the sound delay in my outdoor performances. No theater also inspired me in the development of my own visual language. The percussive musical accompaniment with players sitting on the stage to one side, the use of props made of simple materials like paper and wood. The Kabuki theater was also of interest in which allusions were made, for instance, of the sea with paper and other special effects, which were done using natural materials. Speaking of um, using what is at hand, what you're seeing now is a piece called Nova Scotia Beach Dance. Although the piece was happening on the beach itself, it was seen from overhead by a group standing on the cliff above. I wanted this viewpoint. And um, in this case, the concept was of a, a bricolore. Everything I used was found on the beach. So for using materials at hand. I wanted this viewpoint. I've spent every summer since 1970 in Cape Breton, Canada. And every summer, I record the landscape and perform for the video camera. When I moved to Soho in 1968, it was relatively empty. And artists were able to move into old, recently abandoned factory lofts that had the beauty of another time. It wasn't expensive to find a place to perform or exhibit one's work. You could work on the streets, lots, and docks without getting permission from the city. My performance in Vitti reflected that setting. It was an atmosphere grainy and rough. This performance is Delay Delay from 1972 with a group of people who, as usual, were friends and artists. For instance, Gordon Matta Clark is in this piece. I would work on location, in this case, the empty lots of Lower West Side of New York, for a few months with ideas developed previously at Jones Beach in Nova Scotia, and then rehearse with a group before performing in public. For delay, delay, the audience sat on a roof of a loft building on Chambers Street, overlooking these empty lots where old factory buildings had recently been torn down. This work dealt with the perception of both distance and the overhead view. The film Song Delay was based on Delay Delay and shot in this location in order to recreate the illusion of the space. 
In other words, the distance and the activity over a wide viewpoint. I worked with a filmmaker, Robert Fiore, and we used two lenses, a telephoto lens, since you wouldn't be able to see the sound delay in the distance through a normal lens, and a wide angle lens to record the area of the empty lots. It was pure accident that boats went up and down the Hudson River in the background as we recorded. We were very lucky. Every time we started to record the wood clapping sound delay, the boats went by. Yeah, it was real bad. Here we see an image of organic honey's visual telepathy. Can you turn the sound up a little bit? No, don't do, don't. Anyway, the music is a reggae music that I adore. Um, I hear it in the background. The first video performance that I ever did. I bought a video camera. Up to this. Here we see an, an image of Organic Honey's visual telepathy, the first video performance that I ever did. I bought a video camera in Japan in 1970 and started working with closed circuit video systems, which was quite a revolutionary video system at that time. Artists seeing themselves live, performing and recording at the same time. I don't think you can imagine what it was like. Um, this was unlike um, recording and film, where you can't see the results of recording until later. It was really a radical moment. This device altered my way of performing. I began to perform for the camera. I didn't want to be recognized as myself, so I wore masks, I dressed up, I played with disguise, I developed imaginary characters or states of mind, alter egos in a way. I found myself in the mirror walk works and through video transformations. Organic Honey's visual telepathy evolved as I found myself continuously investigating my own image in the monitor of my video machine. I then bought a mask of a doll's face, which transformed me, formed me into an erotic seductress. I named this TV persona Organic Honey. I began increasingly obsessed with following the process of my own theatricality as my images fluctuated between the narcissistic and a more abstract representation. The risk was to become too submerged in solipsistic gestures. In exploring the possibilities of female imagery, thinking always of magic show, I attempted to fashion a dialogue between my different disguises and the fantasies they suggested. This was in part inspired by the feminist movement of the time. I was exploring the idea of what is the female, what is the male in imagery, because at that time people were saying, oh, a stick is male and the sun is, you know, the moon is female, the sun is male. And um, I wanted to really get away from that dichotomy. Um, this was inspired, yeah. There was a small monitor in the space of the performance connected to the camera. There was this, um, so that I, the performer, could frame and watch my actions. At first I operated the camera, but later I had a camera person as performer. All movements and shots were set up beforehand and rehearsed. I always kept my eye on the small monitor in the performance space in order to control the image. The audience saw this live performance simultaneously with the image transmitted from the camera to the projection or the monitor. This was a detail of the live action. So the experience was of a double narrative linked. In subsequent video performances, I continued to explore this space of perception. I am interested in drawing during performance. A drawing in a performance is different than drawing alone in my studio where there are no witnesses. The performance affects the drawing. As organic honey, I drew for the monitor while looking at the monitor and not at the drawing. 
I found different ways to include drawing as a live activity for the audience. I think continuously of how to work with screens, the design of the screen and how to work with projection on the screen. I'm interested in creating my own special effects using my own technological trickery. I do work with a peculiar and specific technology of video, but at the same time, I include something I call the handmade aspect, almost always revealing to the audience how the images are made. The audience is watching a process. Mirage from 1976 was designed particularly for the anthology film archives. It was the last of a series of video performances working with early black and white technology and was structured in relation to the projection screen of the cinematic. Because one could change the size and shape of the screen, various movements were performed in relation to these shapes. A large monitor turned on its side played pre-recorded videos such as May Windows and Good Night, Good Morning. These works were recorded by a camera turned on its side to fit the vertical format. In this piece, I included two 16 millimeter films, a drawing film and a film of volcanic eruptions, both projected. However, the screens were mostly blank, serving as backdrops for my movements on a small black wooden table or stage. Sometimes, this, if the screen was backlit, one could see through it, and we performed behind the screen, working with the transparency. I did not include the live camera and the closed circus, circuit in this piece. In Mirage, props include a group of nine-foot tin cones, a small hoop, and a Central American wooden mask of a man. For the 30-minute film, my act of drawing was recorded by a filmmaker. I made a series of drawings on a blackboard. Drawing and erasing, in this case, images or symbols were part of my vocab that were part of my vocabulary. This is a weather symbol and a heart I draw over and over, a basic iconic image. I was inspired by films of Maya Deren, the American filmmaker who spent time in Haiti filming the voodoo rituals. Practitioners were making drawings over and over again on the dark ground with lines of white powder. I have referred to Mirage more than once and I've used this drawing film in other works or as part of the installation version of Mirage. Mirage is a piece I go back to in order to develop, to develop certain aspects of it in new work. It interests me to go back to an early work, take part of it, and work with it in relation to other material. I'm interested in how the content is altered by juxtaposition or by being in a different context. But Mirage lends itself to, an ongoing, to ongoing abstract considerations. For instance, I've used the footage shot in Wall Street at night repeatedly in different ways, but most work at some point is considered finished. Once we went, I think, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, mentioning Wall Street, I went down there with Pat Steer. Do I mention that, David, in the lecture? No. So anyway, an artist, Pat Steer, a painter, we went down one night with a, a video um, artist with a camera, and we br brought my tin cones, and we performed in the streets of Wall Street at night. We only attracted one man who took a liking to Pat and was chasing her all over. We were both wearing white dresses, and it was, um, that's what you could do then. You can't do that now, I don't think. But I well, here I am sitting on top of a television set, which was turned on its side in a vertical position, and making a series of gestures. The image of the cone inspired me to include volcano footage. The whole piece involved the idea of opposites. It was an abstract piece dealing with light and dark. These are images of a piece called Stage Sets. I thought of the constructed situations for all my performances as stage sets, but this particular arrangement is autonomous and not made for a particular performance. It is presently on exhibit at Dia Beacon along with the shape, the scent, and the feel things. So you could go up to Dia Beacon, please do, if you want to see some work, some installations. This is the juniper tree. Are we there yet? Yes. Yeah the first version for children. In 1976, I started working with a narrative or storytelling inspired by prose fiction. As with the mirror, the video, the outdoor work, narrative, I would say, 
was another altering medium in which the image relates to a story and is affected by the story. This is the first version of the juniper tree based on a fairy tale by the Grimm brothers. It was made for children, which interests me to have children react and respond to the work. It was the favorite story of one of my closest friends, Susan Howe's son, um, Mark, Mark, um, Mark, it was his favorite story. I just say that because it's a very grim story. When I, when I showed it, the, the mothers came up to me before the performance and I said, oh my God, are you showing this to our children? And I had to say them, I just read Brunel Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment, in which he explains how fairy tales help children to, to understand danger and so on, and to get through difficult situations. In this case, the tree is a ladder, an iconic way of representing a tree. The wooden rope structure was the house. When I began working with a story, I analyze it, take it apart, and I note the colors, in this case, red and white, red as blood and white as snow, traditional fairy tale colors. On the red cloth, I drew an anatomical heart turned into a face, representing the boy. On the white cloth for the girl, I drew a valentine heart, which also became a face, each step at different moments in the performance, and then hung the drawings on the wall. They became part of the set. Installations are adjusted for various situations. In 1994, when I had a show at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam, it was the first time that I had a major show of installations that were translations of performances. This is the installation of organic honey. I wanted the audience to experience the work in a different way. I take all the elements, the video, the sound, the structures, the screens, the props, and I rearrange them. In other words, I take the performance apart so it's not based on linear time, but exists in a different experience of time. The audience chooses what to look at and when. As they walk through the space, the sounds of the different videos play together. What interests me now is the form of the installation, this way of, of exhibiting a work in a space that I construct. This is the installation version of Mirage, as I mentioned earlier, the two films side by side, the drawing film and the film I made to go with it. The second film consisted of footage shot in the early 70s and includes footage shot off the TV at the time because I wanted to bring everyday current events into the work and juxtapose what I was doing in the privacy of my studio with what was going on in the world around me. I'm very aware of what's going on in the world. The juniper tree relates to the idea of the female, for instance, and in this case with Mirage, the Vietnam War, Nixon, and so forth are referred to. This is the performance version of Volcano Saga, um, a piece based on, a, on an Icelandic saga, Lax Dela Saga. I began to work with projections of, in color as backdrops, reflecting the narrative and placed in relation to the space of the performance. The video is edited to form a parallel narrative to the live action in and around it. In this case, it's on three different screens. The third screen is behind a piece of glass that I stand behind at time and use as a sounding board, knocking on it or painting on it. I visited Iceland to work with performers and to record the, the uh, landscape and to also learn more about the sagas. I continue to explore ways of telling a story. I do not illustrate the story, I represent it. The projection and the live performance form parallel narratives. I perform in the image and beside it always in relation to it. In each of my work, I've made my own soundtracks or work to the composer. For Volcano Saga, I worked with the composer Alvin Lucier. Tilda Swinton played the main part. The characters in an Icelandic saga are more three-dimensional, as they are based mostly on real historical figures. In Iceland, when you mention certain figures, they say, oh yeah, he lived over there, or he lived in that town. So they really are based on their own history. Um, fairy tales were two-dimensional. 
cardboard cutouts, either good or evil. I wanted to have an experienced performer, in this case, Tilda, to play the part of Gudrun, the main character, a woman who is married four times. She has a series of four dreams that foretold her future. Ron Vauder, an actor from the Worcester Group, played the seer who interpreted these dreams. After several large-scale epic works, I started to think in miniature. I began to make a series of sculptural objects, long wooden boxes echoing the shape of a cone but squared. Inside, the larger end is a stage with a video backdrop. The viewer stands and looks into the box. This piece was the first one I did. It was called Tap Dancing. It's a poetic documentary about a form of dance they do in Canada, and it's about a particular folk dancer. The movement is called step dancing. Children use, learn these dances. I've made six of these with different subjects and shapes. This is My New Theater 3. You can also see my new theater, another My New Theater behind this. This is another example of drawing in relation to my body. I put a wet sheet over me and I drew its outlines on the sheet in charcoal. It looks like my skeleton on the outside of my body. After this, I began to do these drawings in performance by tracing over a large piece of Japanese paper held against my body. In 1968, when I began to perform publicly, I had the desire to develop my own language, as I've mentioned. I feel the following works, my most recent, are coming together of all these ideas of the early works. I have developed them into longer and more complicated narratives. I think you're looking at waltz right now. I can hear the music. Lines in the Sand was based on a long poem called Helen in Egypt, written by H.D. or Hilda Doolittle. H.D. was an American writer living in the early part of the 20th century who was analyzed by Sigmund Freud in the 30s. I include quotes from her memoir, Tribute to Freud. It was written right before the Second World War. I grew up in the Second World War. War is a background condition. There's a section from H.D.'s book about her analysis with Freud that begins, that refers to this time before World War II in a certain way. And I'm just, one line begins, there was something beating in my brain. Helen of Troy was blamed for the Trojan War. Of course, a woman had to be blamed. H.D.'s account is based on a classical reference that stated that Helen never went to Troy, but went to Egypt. The Helen that was in Troy was a phantom, a copy, and that it was actually a trade war. I was thinking of the fact that we are still at war and that the true reasons are never made explicit. I am interested in these historic mythic female female figures and the echoing theme of the double. For part of my research, I visited Las Vegas, where we recorded scenes in a casino called Luxor. The fake Luxor was juxtaposed against the real Egypt, represented in the work by photographs that my grandmother took when she visited Egypt at the end of the 19th century. This was an echoing of the theme of the double. I do not play Helen. There are two of us performing, echoing the real and the fake. In this case, I'm making a large drawing of a step pyramid, suitable to the scale of the performance space or stage. I often become obsessed with one form. In this case, the pyramid and the sphinx, drawing the image over and over again on a blackboard while being recorded. This is one of my several drawing videos. Are you going to play the next video? Is it on? It's on. This is, um... This oh, this is the... 
shape does that feel? Like? Of being a seismograph. Okay. Around 200, 2003, I started to develop the shape, the scent, the feel of things, which is at Dear Beacon also, the video version of it. The, the title of the piece is quoted from H.D.'s writing, but the piece was based on a book by Abby Warburg, a German art historian, whose methods interested me of looking at um, the history of culture, uh, parallel cultures, comparing images from different cultures, and so on. Um, because in this epoch of chaotic the piece was based on a book by Abby Werberg, Images from the Region of the Pueblo the Indians of North America. In the early part of the, the 20th century, Warburg, a German art historian, order. visited the Southwest and saw that certain ceremonies of an indigenous people's the Hopi. Through his writing, I returned to my own memory of seeing the snake dance of the Hopi in Arizona without in any way representing these images. I had avoided referring to this dances because we do not have the right to um, in any way um, represent them, but it could not help but uh, it was an amazing experience that stayed with me all my life. I designed the work for the very large basement space of Dia Beacon. In 2005, I began to work with Jason Moran, the jazz composer who composed music and played live in the piece. This has been a long-lasting and important collaboration. We continue to work together for reading Dante, reading animation, and they come to us without a word. We still perform together. We, perform, we just performed reanimation in Japan right before the pandemic. I spent two years working on a script and recording video in many locations. My research took me to the desert landscape of the southwest of America and southern California and woods and beaches of Canada. The haunting images from the Salton Sea, I don't know how many of you know what that is, it's a place in the southern part of, um, uh, of California, and it's a falling apart ex-resort by a famous architect, I can't remember his name right now, I'm sure we should look it up, and um, you probably know who it is in the Salton Sea, the architect, who built a resort, and we, it's part of the background of this piece, which you, I don't think you're seeing. Um, the haunting images of the Salton Sea for me represented the decay of certain American culture and became a backdrop for the song Pastures of Plenty by Woody Guthrie. It's an ironic ju juxtaposition. It says something about America. Layers of actions occur in relation to the space and the projection. At the end of the work, the character Warburg walks down the length of the enormous warehouse space in Dia Beacon the metal doors roll open, letting in a flood of light as he walks outdoors. We, we worked for six piece developing this, uh, six, six, uh, six weeks, Jason and I, developing the soundtrack for this piece. Reanimation, the next piece, was based on the Icelandic writer Haldor Laxness, Under the Glacier. It's a novel, a work of fiction written in 1968. I shot it partly in Norway and partly in my loft in New York. While in Norway, I met a Sami singer named Ande Sambi. We recorded his animal songs, which were part of the soundtrack. Jason Moran composed and played the music again. Reanimation was my first piece in which I wanted to include questions about the problems in the environment in my work. Of course, I had always been thinking about these things. I was struck by Laxness' writing and its focuses on the poetic presence of glaciers, nature, and its creatures. I use crystals in the piece because glaciers are made of ice crystals. Because my work is always set in the present, I had to take into consideration when creating the piece that glaciers are melting. I used footage from a 1973 video called Disturbances, which was located in and by a swimming pool with shots of women swimming underwater, this referring to a future world underwater. From my time in Kitakyushu, Japan, with the Center for Contemporary Art Kitakyushu, I had worked with Soji screens. So I reconfigured the piece and had these paper screens made for the video projections for reanimation. It really alters the perception of the image because seen from one side, it divides the image into a grid pattern. Images are back projected, so visible from both sides of the screen. The audience can walk into the architectural space and be surrounded by the projected images. Also part of the piece, but outside of the room, like space, 
are two large minor theaters playing other fragments of the abstract narrative. In the performance of reanimation, I made a drawing with ink and ice. This is an image of the drawing projected through the crystals and metal structure. I thought of the black ink on the white snow as a kind of polluting element. Just another example of how I work with drawing. Here I draw on the snow in Norway with paint. This is an example of how Jason Moran and I work. Can you turn it up? A little louder. Jason's composed for my work and when he plays it I always have to get up and dance if I can <laughs> because um, anyway he recently he re when I come to his concerts he often plays it which uh, it, it's deeply emotional but I love it it's my it's one of my favorite um, piece of Jason's in relation to my music um, Jason plays at the village of Vanguard every uh, during the Thanksgiving holidays I recommend it as a, I love going there to hear his music Anyway, this is an example of how Jason and I work together. I'm making a drawings of birds as fast as I can and sliding paper away, one after another, inspired by the music. I was particularly inspired by one of Haldor Laxness' descriptions of a bird standing erect against strong winds of a storm. They come to us without a word. I was invited to represent the United States at the Venice Biennale in 2015. Again, this is an example of one work segueing into another. I quoted Laxness, a beautiful quote about the miraculous action of bees and what they do and, and how they function. I wanted to make a piece about animals and include children as performers. For me, this represented the fact of our fragile environment that children will inherit. In each room, there were two projections. One concerned the main subject of the room, the bees, the fish, the wind, and the homeroom for the children. The other projection concerned ghost stories from the oral tradition of Cape Breton, Canada. I thought of the ghosts of creatures that are disappearing. Oh, now there's a video. And then you know the other one with the fan. I'll let them play a little bit. The one with the fan. The video that was in the wind room. same music. It's the same music. But this was made for the Venice Pavilion 
in one. It was in the room, um, one of the rooms. And the children will. Uh, when I show you the latest work I've been doing, the same children, I, I invite them year after year if they can come to be in my work because they they start out quite young, like how many years ago? Seven years ago, and um, the two female characters are now young women, and there's still a little girl. She's 13 now and um, is my neighbor. So I like very much working with people I know. No? Yeah. In this piece, stream or river, flight or pattern, birds are a major presence in the work. Also continuing to work with children. While I was traveling, I recorded video in Vietnam, Spain, Singapore, and Italy. I didn't have a plan, I just took my camera with me and recorded what interested me. Particularly the bird um, zoos in the uh, Far East are very special, beautiful, um, they're actually beautiful zoos. And um, I never thought I would go back to zoos, but one has to, to see creatures. Um, I projected the videos on a wall in my loft and then performed in front of them and recorded it, as I've done so often throughout the years. The thread of my work from the very beginning has always been my role as a performer. I step into a piece and move, guided by the music, the text, the props, and both inspired and working in the space with other the performers. Shelf, looking out window. Lion by the window. Wood. Colors covered with writing. Books nailed to table. Surveillance. Flashback. Movement from mad to bird. Animal trail. Flight patterns. Shadows. Large fox head, paper mache, red mouth, top shelf, looking at coyote. Tiger mask, orange with black markings. Squat, bird, green, purple, yellow, ceramic with interior bell. Bird on branch, shot, stuffed, brown, buried. Perched owl on green base, wood is split, heart-shaped face. Gray, oversized elephant, painted wood, exaggerated trunk. Behind. White wooden carved rabbit, gentle. Um, the wind is only the voice of the trees ready for stillness. The air is soundless. It belongs. was actually sung by, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. It's terrible, I should have thought of this, but Allison. She was a student here at Columbia. I met her in one of my visits to the um, art department of the graduate school. And for this situation, she came, she came to, um, to Santander in Spain and took a workshop with me. Now she's become really well known. And um, I will send her name to, to you so that we don't forget. I'm very bad with names. But anyway, the way we did this song was I gave her fragments from Japanese plays that I put together, and I asked her to make a song. And she, that's what she did. She took a song, it's a folk song, American folk song, and she sang it with the words. It's amazing, I think, anyway. I'm sure you think so, too. <laughs> I continue to explore these ideas in my recent piece about the ocean. Now, I'm going into um, another, uh, way of talking to you, but I'll read a little bit and then I'm going to show you a number of videos that are from my most recent piece concerning the ocean and the environment. <coughs> Moving off the land. So what is the video? It's the still video, but it's not, uh, it's not playing. All right, well, we'll wait until we, okay. 
The situation facing the planet is dire, and I am profoundly saddened by this crisis. However, I am grateful through my work to have gained a deeper understanding for creatures both in the ocean and on the land. I believe if we understand the importance of these miraculous creatures, we can better understand ourselves and live in harmony. Um, I think before we show, I think I will show you uh, this series and I'll talk, I'll ad lib as they're playing, but I want to say before, um, I was invited by Utameta Bauer uh, to, to make a piece about the ocean and uh, to work with an organization, TBA 21, um, which its main, its main function is to support work about the ocean and um, to, to preserve the ocean. It's idealistic, but it's the way one starts. I just read t last night in The New Yorker, there's a piece about a marine biologist, Sylvia Earle, who is older than I am. I won't tell you how old I am, but, but she's older than I am and she's still diving and she develops, um, one of the things she does has developed deep sea containers and she goes to the bottom of the sea. She spent how long there, did you remember? Like weeks under the ocean. And she's still diving, it's amazing. I'm afraid to dive. So when I started um, working on this piece, I collected, um, the way I worked on it was to uh, visit aquariums whenever I could and record the animals. And to, um, I, I read books, The Soul of the Octopus is a book about the octopus. It's very touching and beautiful and tells you, you'll never want to eat an octopus again. I mean, actually, when people see my work, they often say, I'm never going to eat an octopus again. And Sylvia Earle doesn't eat any fish. She doesn't think we should. Um, so through a newspaper on the internet and uh, another book, and then books by Rachel Carson, I don't know how many of you know who she was. She was uh, a, a woman who wrote in the 60s, beginning in the 50s and 60s, about the environment. Her first book that was a bombshell was called The Silent Spring. And as long ago as that, they knew what was happening to the planet, people knew, and still did little to halt that progress of destruction. And Rachel Carson, I think, is also a poet. I dedicated this piece to her. She, her writing is beautiful about all aspects of the ocean. So I'm going to play you a series of videos from this piece, and I'll say a little bit about each one, but very little. And you can ask questions about it later. I'll just move so I can see it. So this is. Uh, you played that one already. Oh, you did. Yeah. That was okay. The first few are the performance. So the performance and the installation are separate entities, but related and interchangeable because I use um, images in one and the other. However, you'll see the performance has different images, and I must also say that. Not only did I work with these uh, writers, but I worked, I met through TBA 21. That's why I met Andras, mm -hmm. which thank goodness. <laughs> and, uh, I also met a marine biologist named David Gruber, who I wanted, I, d I decided I wanted to work with him because TBA doesn't really tell you what to do, but they organize convenings, they call them, and they put people together. And so you meet people in, in the field and you can, decide yourself who you might want, want to work with. So uh, David Gruber interested me, and we're still working together, because he has, he's a marine biologist, he's a diver, and he also has developed cameras and lenses that can record underneath the water the luminescence of sea creatures, which you cannot see with your naked eye. So that's one thing he's doing. He's now doing a huge research project on the sperm whale. So. Um, David, you can play. I'll just talk while this is going on. Yeah. So this is an image from the performance where I'm making drawings of fish that I, I've met. When I was in Kitakushu in Japan, I, my first um, endeavor drawing fish was to make 100 drawings of fish. I found a Japanese book on fish um, in the area of Japan. And they're one of these, it's a beautiful um, science, kind of scientific book with beautiful colored uh, drawings, which inspired me to make these drawings of fish in red paint, as you can see. 
And in the background, when I went to Norway, I went to an aquarium in Norway on the Lofoten Islands, which are amazing. They're islands that are mountains, really, and they, they rise, they're sort of like this, they rise from the sea. And I spent, a friend of mine had a house there, it's above the Arctic Circle, and I spent about a month there one winter with her driving me around, photographing the landscape, which was in reanimation, which I used in reanimation. So this is another clip from the performance. Can you put the sound up? I'll just tell you, I had two bells, and so I played the bells. I play little instruments like that, and Jason and I do a duet, actually, in which I play my instruments, which consist of bells and toys and things I bang together. And he, he, well, of course, it's up to him to fit into that. But it's one of my most pleasurable experiences in performing, is to do that with Jason. So in this case, the other performer is telling me, I can't see anything, I'm blindfolded. He's telling me to move from left to right in front of the, um, these images of starfish. So one thing with the children, I thought of children, you know, to, to show them how beautiful these sea creatures are, because most of us don't really see them. Or, and next day. So we'll just keep this for a minute. This is an, uh, a, a still of the piece as it was transformed into a large installation shown in Venice, uh, I don't know, how, a few years ago. And um, I built these big boxes that, that are giant minor theaters that I mentioned before, um, architectural elements or sculptural elements in the space. And each of these boxes, because there was a lot of light, and I had to control the light with the projections. And so I made these boxes so that the light, and also I liked the idea that the audience could go into the box and sit and really concentrate on the video. And, all, and the children, uh, you'll see later, are going to play some. And then we decorate, the drawings are from um, the performances and so on. We decorated the space. It's a beautiful church that TBA uh, 21 has leased for how many years? 20 years or something. What? Yeah. And um, it was a fantastic place to, to, to work in, as you can see. I love working in these big spaces, architectural spaces. And um, yeah, they inspire me. What can I say? All right, next David. That's Lila, whose dad is here. Where is he? OK. The mind evolved in the sea. Water made it possible. All early stages took place in water. The origin of life, the birth of animals, the evolution of nervous systems, the appearances of complex bodies that made brains worth having. Zora Kosebera, that's her, who that is. And this, don't play it, let, wait for a minute. Um, this is, you'll see first, we call this mermaid, because when I started working on this piece, I thought, well, how can I approach such a vast subject as the oceans? And as usual, I approach it through myth, because that's the thread that runs throughout my work. I was just thinking in relation to your introduction, Matisse said, uh, that he always, when he's thinking about his work or gets stuck, he looks for a thread running through the work. I always remember that. And um, so, so one of my, th this is one of my threads. Uh, what was I saying? Sorry. Um, what? Myth. Oh, myth. Yeah, so one of my <laughs> threads is myth. So I thought of the myth of the mermaid, which is all over the globe, and every culture that lives by the ocean has at one point had the myth of creatures living in the ocean. And it were, it's, I think we have a memory in our DNA because you know whales once came onto the dry land and then went back into the ocean. And there's, so there's a 
real connection with these creatures and who knows how long and what happened. But so me, for me, the mermaid was a theme in this piece. And um, you'll see, these are the children, again, performing. We shoot this in my loft, but I record the, the footage in other places. And the way I worked with David Gruber was uh, to, he would show me, he's, he doesn't, he says he's not an artist, but his, his, uh, his, his, his recordings are really beautiful, that he shoots underwater. And I have to say that I wish that I could have gone underwater, but I just don't have the courage to put it, you know, put something on my back and dive. <laughs> But I think that it's very important, like people like Sylvie Earle and, and, and David, they have to. You know, they're people, and also people who are um, at home doing that. Um, so in this case, you'll see David Gruber's footage. You'll see this magical green uh, material with yellow lights. That's his footage. So I, he would bring his, his work to my studio, and I would look at it and then choose what I really thought was beautiful. He was very generous in that way, and that's how I work with him now. Now we're working on another slightly different type of project. Go on. So David, you can come. And the sound is um, Ikoe Mori. I began to work with the composer Ikoe Mori for this uh, ocean piece. What's the next one? So this is the, I think this is the last one, right? Uh, there's one more. There is, all right, well, let's just play this. Two marine biologists published a study of giant manta rays responding to their reflection in a large mirror installed in their aquarium in the Bahamas. The two captive rays circled in front of the mirror, blew bubbles, and performed unusual body movements as if checking their reflection. They made no obvious attempt to interact socially with their reflection, suggesting that they did not mistake what they saw as other rays. Okay, the what's the next one? Oh yeah, let's just play this. The seahorse is completely encased in an armor composed of interlocking bony plates. These take the place of ordinary scales and seem to be a sort of evolutionary harking back to the time when fish depended on heavy armor to protect them from their enemies. So that's a quote from Rachel Carson. And it's uh, the red um, seahorses are David's shots of the seahorses. And so that's the end of my lecture. <laughs> oh, there's, oh, sorry. There's one more, yeah. Um, TBA 21. The woman who runs it, Francesca, she said, "Well, why don't you can't you do a piece for the other room too?" So, uh, I made a big drawing of a whale that we suspended, and then play it loud. This is David Gruber's um, sound recording of sperm whales, and what he's doing now, he's working with how to interpret these sounds if it's possible which is quite, a, quite an endeavor. But I think many scientists are working to understand the language of animals. I think that's something that's going on right now. But in this case, the sperm whale. And the sperm whale, as you know, is an amazing creature. All right, well, that is the end of my lecture. Thank you. I just, I, I, I want to thank David. Thank you, David.
And I, I want to thank Andras, and also he invited me to be in Singapore, and I did a piece about the oceans there. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. But I guess now we're going to have a, another stage of this situation, right? Yeah. A question and answer. So please ask questions if you have questions. But I'm not sure. Um, I was just saying that um, I'm sure that there are many questions from the audience also because so many, so many of the uh, concerns that you raised, especially at the end about the fragility um, of the environment in this moment are very much on our minds as well um, in this course and as architects. Um, so I, you, I have another question uh, which is about drawing. Um, and I, I wrote this out because you circulated your talk beforehand, so I hope it's not too kind of overcooked. Um, but I think drawing might be another kind of common denominator between um, your work and, and the practice of architecture. So as I was watching your uh, performance and moving off the land, um, I was thinking about a passage in uh, the very first treatise of architecture by Vitruvius, uh, De Architectura. Uh, in which he, he describes the discovery of the architectural plan, or, or what he describes as ichnographia, or footprint, footprint writing as a kind of shipwreck story. So he says that um, in book six, he writes that the Greek philosopher Aristippus uh, washes up on the beach at Rhodes, uh, and there in the sand he sees human footprints which take different geometric forms. And then rather than being scared that you know there are these footprints on the beach, uh, he says to his fellow castaways, take heart, for here are the vestiges of man. And then they go into Rhodes, and they go to the gymnasium, and they start to, to uh, discuss philosophy. So I was thinking that in moving off the land, you, you kind of reverse the direction of this architectural myth. I mean, you're asking us to go uh, from the beach back into the water, uh, but drawing remains the kind of vehicle for that translation. So um, instead of revealing the vestiges of man, your drawings trace or sometimes uh, even chase or try to catch up with many other forms of life. Um, it often seems to me that your drawings have like no time to spare. They have a sort of urgency to them. So I was wondering, since Vitruvius's story uh, has for so long served as a point of origin for a humanistic uh, practice of architectural drawing and plan making, uh, if you could teach architects how to draw, where would you start, and what would we have to forget if we tried to draw uh, at the speed of, of a fish? Well, I'll just say, when I went to art school, my teacher, Harold Tobish, <laughs> I was, I had to learn how to draw. You know, it's, it's, a, it's something, a practice. Some people are naturals, and other people have to learn. Anyway, I was learning, and so the first thing he said to me was, just draw the outline. You just concentrate on the outline of something. And I would say you could do the same thing with buildings or with anything. So I wasn't drawing buildings at the time, I was just drawing the outline. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, was, I was trying to make, a, I guess, a distinction between this is, a, this is something that I was discussing also with my students before your lecture about some of the differences between the ways that architects use drawing to usually to anticipate some, something in the future versus in your performances, your drawings seem to be catching up or, or sort of chasing um, nat natural phenomena that are kind of out, outpacing your own well, I draw, um, I mean, what I, the way I approach drawing is, and I think architecture students could do it in a very different way, but I approach drawing as every time I do a new piece, I think of how can I include drawing in relation to the technology and to the subject, and how can the drawing function in that way. I don't just, I mean, I often also make drawings in my studio of creatures like, you know, fish, and I became particularly fascinated with the colors and so on, structures of fish. But so each time, you know, to think of a new way to actually physically make the drawing. So for instance, I make the drawings like I look at the monitor and I don't look at the page, or uh, I make a drawing while walking around in relation to movement. And I think particularly for architects, for me, 
Um, I mean, I also, I'm not, I didn't study architecture, but I have thought may, maybe I could have been an architect. I don't know, <laughs> you know, <laughs> not really. But, but um, I was always interested in walking into, when I was like looking at art history, walking into a church, walking into or a cathedral, for instance, Gothic cathedral or Romanesque cathedral. So, or uh, you know, going to Greece and seeing the um, architecture of Greece and so on. And, and also in Crete, for instance. Um, I mean, not in Crete, in the um, Greek islands, the c incredible continuous architecture of the islands. That there's, everything is joined together. I'm just speaking um, off, it's very hard to answer your question. <laughs> but I'm just saying that um, in each case, you could go and like in the architecture in the Greek islands, I never thought of this before, or, or will never do it, but you could go and sit in one place and draw what is all around you. You know, instead of drawing something like this, you could physically just, you know, approach it in a very different way and, and make a different kind of drawing in that way. Or you can draw on the sand or in the dirt. Does um, that answer your question? I don't know. It's a difficult <laughs> question. Complicated. Um, yeah, maybe something we'll continue to discuss. Okay. And I know that David uh, uh, is also someone who practices as well, so. Yeah, no, I, I think, uh, well, I guess you can hear me. Um, I think we're, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for this wonderful talk. I mean, it, I think it's an honor to have you here. And also, um, me personally, um, you know, having research in ocean environments, um, and a project with small islands, but also research in New York in this really important period in the 60s, 70s, where a generation of artists and uh, institutions were born out of this kind of fertile ground of experimentation. Um, and also like this interesting unconventional uses of spaces like you know 112 Green Street and the kitchen. Um, but also really important issues um, just ongoing in terms of like marginalization. Um, and of course yours, you, you know, have a completely different uh, story or perspective. Um, but I think, you know, just to continue this conversation of like the commonalities and, and interests, um, I'm really intrigued by your research work. And um, you mentioned in uh, Han Yekan's book, In the Shadow, a Shadow, I think as um, maybe architects, we also delve into some kind of exploration at the beginning. Um, and you know, if nothing else, it's so that we know something about what we're starting to, to delve into or talk about. Um, so um, I think this process is really, for architects, very complex and varied, right? How you begin this project and, and how to start thinking about things. Um, in your work, um, you always delve into some kind of deep understanding, whether it's the poetry of Hilda Doolittle or writings of Jorge Luis Borges. And I was wondering um, how you begin that process or how you navigate that process. And perhaps, um, you know, sometimes it's more fateful or serendipity or sometimes, you know, very kind of deliberate and uh, choreographed in a way. But I was wondering if you could talk about that research aspect of your work, and I think you know that's something like a lot of us are, are dealing with also. I, okay, I'm just going to say something related, uh, not related probably, but I'll just talk about the way I looked at uh, Renaissance paintings were my one of my in inspirations for looking at a framed space and how uh, the painter dealt with the shapes and forms. And I mentioned Sassetta. I don't, you know, his paintings. They're very beautiful. It's the Architecture. I love the way architecture was depicted in those paintings, and it was often pastel colors, and, you know, and also odd, odd shapes, but in the painting. And then Piero della Francesca became more classical. So I was very always interested in how the Renaissance painters depicted architectural space as an important container. Um, how I begin. I could begin like that. I could begin, I could go home and say, okay, Sassetta. And, but I begin uh, sometimes by getting a lot of books and spreading that out on, on a table and looking at them and taking things from each book and putting them. It's a kind of collage technique, a way of beginning. 
Um, I also have to begin, uh, like I said, with the form, the cone. That's another way to begin, to begin with a shape and to make everything like the cone I made. I made, um, you saw shapes of performance spaces with the form of a cone, thinking of the form of a cone. And like, it's a basic shape. I, I like the cone better than the cube. For me, it's more eccentric and not so boring after all. <laughs> the cube can get boring, right? Yeah. But, um, and so I also, like I was thinking, Haldor Laxness, I began with one of his quotes about bees. And then, so then I did research on bees. Like for that piece, his quote about the bee is so beautiful. And so we found a beekeeper in Long Island, I mean in Brooklyn, and we went and visited him and I filmed the bees and then put the children in the, in the uh, honeycombs. And, uh, and that's the way I begin with, uh, with something small and then expand it. Hmm. And also uh, with Rachel Carson, like the, uh, the, the seahorses, the idea that they have armor. Anyway, that's... Okay. Um, no, I, I think that's incredibly helpful um, and, and, you know, really fascinating to understand your process. So going from like the beginning of the process to maybe like not the end, but like later in the stages, um, I think, you know, Hans Olbers, Ulrich, in, in a conversation you mentioned uh, this kind of revisiting of the theme or a kind of continuity between projects or even within itself. Uh, which is very, very fascinating, this kind of transforma transformation. Um, for example, Lines in the Sand was first shown as a video performance in 2002, and then moving to um, you know, the kitchen in 2004, and then the, the Museo d'Art Contem Contemporary de Barcelona in 2007, um, and who knows, maybe in MoMA in, in a couple years. Um, so I was just wondering um, maybe how you think of um, this process in, towards the end of your project where um, in some ways the audience has a greater role in interpretation, but at the same time, your own perception of how these projects are changing over time. And you know, as the world changes, or in some ways the world stays the same, um, you know, how much of the work is autonomous and how much of it is a kind of reflection both literally and figuratively um, that's you know changing over time. So I think the work changes interestingly from site to site, but in a kind of time-based manner. Uh, you know, if you look at a project that is maybe like you know from a decade ago versus now, um, do you have kind of personal um, kind of retrospective thoughts about what they mean? I mean, it's very complicated. And if I tried to, um, first of all, I do not know really how the audience reacts to my work. I do not know what your thoughts are or what your associations are. Unless I speak to you or I, what I do is I, I make my work, I try to communicate my ideas as clearly as possible. And also, I'm interested in image making, so I try to make it something that will draw the audience in. But I'm not sure, you know? and. When I redo it, I'm sure that pieces I did in, like the organic honey, I think I'm going to show it in MoMA. The audience will see it in a different way from the way the audience saw it when I first showed it. And I don't know. Maybe I'll find out, because I'll have reactions, I hope. But um, so I don't have any, I don't try to control that. That's not something. And I don't, I try to make the work, uh, like for instance, the things you, lines in the sand, I will show it at MoMA exactly in the same way that I showed it recently, wherever it was last, in, in the Tate. You know, because it worked there, I did it. You know, you can't change it all the time, you'd go crazy. And, uh, and also, it wouldn't be appropriate. I'm not interested in doing that either, I'm interested in doing new work. Whenever I do a big show, I try to make a new piece. Because, in other words, to be drawn into the past, into your work, is a kind of could be a deadening experience. You have to continuously keep making new work in order to keep your mind fresh and to keep your idea, like I'm gonna work again with David Gruber on something, but it won't be a major piece because he's very busy, but 
for instance, I'm going back into that um, territory of the fish with him again, but in a very different way. Um, it was very hard for me to let go of the fish piece because, and I probably am going back to it because it's a fascinating subject and, and so heartbreaking and important. And I think it's very important um, to address these issues now. Um, so I think after this, I will think about your question and your question, and I'll be upset. I'll think, how could I have answered that differently? I mean, and what more can I say about it, you know? Yeah, I think those um, are fantastic. What? I think those are fantastic answers. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah, yeah, no, I think We also have an opportunity now to, for you to know, um, you know, how, how they reacted or, uh, and to kind of continue a discussion that we've been having in our, our section. So uh, I wanted to open it up to the audience uh, and especially the students. And, and this time we wanted to try something a little different. So everyone who has a question, just raise your hand at once. Um, and then Jordan and um, Ashraf. But that means you have to choose. Hi, I really love your presentation. And I find really interesting, like on your last works, like moving off the land, how you like transform in the spaces to create like immersive experiences so that people can engage more with these kind of topics. So I'm thinking about like all the things that you said about space and architecture, and I just want to know like, what is your perception of the architect's role like right now? He's asking, um, what is your, he said. I, is I'm sorry, I'm just asking because I can't understand you. Oh, yeah. So he's telling me. It's like a foreign language, I'm sorry. But, Not you know, the microphone and my hearing. So what is it? Uh, the final question was, what is your perception of the architect's role today? Um, yeah, with the transformation of spaces and making like the people engage with these social issues, like you do know, with your projects, like moving off the land. What about moving off the land? I think he's asking how can architects um, uh, give people a sense of the transformation of space in the way that you do in moving off the land? Oh, I don't know how to answer that exactly, but I will say um, I live in New York. I grew up in New York. Um, the architects should fight for their position in, in, in architecture because, frankly, um, New York is being ruined by developers. And um, so maybe architects have to be more fantastical. You know, think of fantasy a little bit more. And I mean, if you look around New York, you see buildings that were built by architects. And then you see buildings that were built by developers who knew nothing. They know nothing about architecture. And this was once a great city. It is still a great city. But I think that um, I know that there is a feeling among some, like there's no more an architect critic at the New York Times. There used to be an architecture critic. No more, why? I don't know the answer to that question. But um, I think you have to, act, maybe you have to um, be, you know, think in practicality, not practicality, but in fantasy. And um, maybe you have to make some, look at the old, those old um, depictions of round buildings or, or anything that happened in the past that is shown to you as a fantastic piece of architecture. We have to go back to that, you know, in a way. I don't know how, but I, I don't know if that answers your question, but. Sorry. Um, first, I, I'm so glad you talk about developers because I totally agree with you. <laughs> they are just totally destroying uh, New York, but uh, <laughs> on, the, on another topic, I. I'm very interested by this kind of com common thread that you have uh, with the myth, because it just it, it leaves both on the on, uh, on the fantasy and and the truth. And, and I think what, what you just speak right of what architects maybe need to move to, it's more of this kind of myth reality, right? That that it can leave beyond kind of the fiction and kind of what what's happening in the real world. So I guess I'm just curious of how and why that trade just kind of continues throughout your work and, and, and how it has affected um, every kind of piece that you, maybe not every piece, but you know, your, your work in general. And, 
And second, how does that play along with, with time, right? Because I, I think that's a very particular thing that meets have. It, it's just time and, and kind of how they play along with the audience. Uh, hopefully that's clear. <laughs> Maybe not too big of a question. I think it's the microphone. You know, if people just spoke loudly, I could probably understand them. The microphones are making it weird. But anyway, go on. What was the question? Um, he's asking you how you make use of myth in your work as a way to traverse time. Is that, that? Well, I mean, I began to work a long, a long time ago when I first began um, because I was interested in mythology. Mythology is main underpinning of my work. It, it, in the earlier video works where there's no language or words, it's all based on, on myth, but it's not visible. It's what I was looking at and how I thought of as an underlying structure. And um, in the history of art, uh, myth is an underlying uh, theme that runs through like every painting. I mean, I'm talking about Western art and Eastern art has a story or a myth. And um, that's not true in modernist uh, painting and sculpture and uh, uh, but it was true, and it's what I related to. As I said, I was interested in how, how do things begin? You know, how does art begin? And how do, so when I started making art, I looked into the beginnings of things, and that's what inspired me. Like the no theater, for instance, began as a ritual and in turn into a theater, um, a theatrical form. And I also strongly um, uh, felt that there has to be a continuity in one's work and there, you know, from beginning to end. So sometimes I often go back, for instance, I've done a lot of reading about the No Theater. And so, for instance, for the piece called They Come to Us Without a Word and that song that I explained, um, I, I, there's books by uh, actually Wester, Fenelosa and Ezra Pound about the No Theater. I go back to that time again. So I often go back and look at my early work, or no, not at the work, but I look at some of the texts that I was inspired by and have forgotten, and, and how do I bring it into the present, and it, re, re, uh, it re-inspires me. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Yes? And also from other cultures. So from the very beginning, uh, I wanted to, it's a, probably a psychological thing of wanting not to be in home, at home, wanting to go to other countries and not wanting to be you know, where I come from. And so um, I was always interested in other cultures, which is another subject, yeah. Maybe if I just could quick oh, sneak no. in a quick question related yeah, well, to that. Because um, you mentioned in your uh. talk that, um, you, that the Hopi snake dance was the one uh, ritual form which did not, um, which, which you did not use uh, later on, like it was... No, I didn't use the ritual forms. Mm -hmm. I didn't. But I, I thought of my own work as a ritual in my community, in Soho, you know, my audience, and they were kind of rituals that I was performing. So how do you begin to make a performance? I don't know. Um, the only direct borrowings I've made of other cultures is uh, from the Moluccan Book of the Dead, a New Guinea tribe, and they had this tradition where they made these beautiful um, geometric looping drawings. Everybody had to know it in order, when they die, you have to know the drawing because when you meet the, they call the devouring witch, at the line between life and death, the witch begins the drawing and you have to finish it in order to pass over. So that's the myth, I never use that myth, but I use the drawings in my performances. I copied them and I learned how to do them. They're beautiful. and continuous line in a grid like that. So it's a beautiful performative action, it can be. Um, I really avoided copying other people's rituals, especially the hope. indigenous Americans. I never used any American myths, um, indigenous American myths in my work. I did work with Japanese myths. It has to do with um, the idea of what is a dominant culture and um, and what is it appropriate to refer to? I feel it's okay for me to ins be inspired by the No Theater, although I never copied it, but I was inspired by it. I mean, this is a complicated subject. And um, yeah, so the, 
I never had the right, and I still don't, to copy anything from the Hopi culture. It's a beautiful culture. I did feel it was all right for me to remind people, you know, to look at it. But, you know, when I saw the snake dance, it was an amazing experience. But I could never, ever bring it directly into my work. So when I read Abby Warburg, who did not hesitate to bring it into his work, in a way, um, I, could, I could quote him without referring visually in any way to the Hopi or referring to the actual snake dance. Never. In that piece, I made a drawing of a snake, but it wasn't a snake dance. So when I work with something like that, like the coyote or the snake, I try to work with something that's indigenous to many cultures and not just one culture. I mean, in that case, like an animal, like a snake or a coyote. The coyote is a very important figure, as you know, for many indigenous cultures and certainly in America and other places. I don't know if that answers your question. But for the Hopi, no, never. But just mentioning it. I didn't even mention the word Hopi in my performance, you know. Hi. Um, so thank you for your, hi, over here. Um, thank you for your presentation. I thought it was really thoughtful. Um, and a certain aspect I really liked was the way that you use mirrors uh, to sort of reflect um, upon the idea that perhaps human activities have some way disrupted the ocean's beauty. But I was wondering how, in considering the objective of fostering a more environment-centric uh, thinking, uh, do you think designers should take a more confrontative uh, stance to express a sense of urgency? Or should it be presented in a more comprehensive way so to allow the audience a sort of freedom to interpret the information that you have presented? Enable the audience what? Enable the audience to interpret the information that you've presented. So. I mean, the audience can interpret it any time <laughs> and in any way they want. I have no control over that. And I don't, um, I think that um, as an artist, you can't get too involved in that because then it would be an endless, it would be an endless, uh, a thing that would distract a little bit. Of course you have dialogues with other, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but of course you have dialogues with other artists and, and the audience, and you bring the audience in. But I don't do um, audience participation. You know, I don't have pieces in which the audience, um, and I'm not, I never actually like the idea of, of, um, of the audience finishing a work. That was a prevalent thing that happened for a while is that the audience could step into a piece and finish it however they wanted to. I can't, it's not interesting to me. Uh, is, that, um, is that why the interaction that you have with the artwork only pertains to you and the artwork, but never with the audience? Is that why your interaction with the artwork only pertains to you and never with the audience? Well, I hope it, it's a little bit of a misinterpretation of what I say. It doesn't only pertain to me, but I'm an individual and I look at it and I see it, you know, I see it the way I can see it. And I say that because I know that this person sitting next to me will have different thoughts. And of course I'm interested in that. I'm interested in, I mean, I love talking to people about it. It's, I have to say, as you get older, you talk less and less when you're young and you're, you're all in school, you exchange ideas and talk a lot about each other's work. As you get older, people like me don't have time, <laughs> you know, to sit around and talk about each other's work. It's a luxury, in a way. I mean, that's, I'm just saying that's one point of view. Maybe people wouldn't agree with me. I mean, I talk to my fellow artists. I go to see their work. Um, we, tr we support each other in that way. And we exchange ideas still, of course. We also exchange ideas without talking to each other, visually and orally. But um, yeah, is that answering the question? I think so. And I also, you, um, we, we are also running out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> but I was wondering if um, maybe we could do a few questions at once. Would that be? Nuria has one over there. Hello. 
Thank you very much for your talk. Um, I found fascinating the continuous experimentation throughout your work. And a very simple question, how do you keep up experimenting without just repeating? Because it, it's inevitable, so I'm fascinated by how you, you keep going, experimenting. I just do. No. <laughs> Um, it's a constant challenge, I have to say. And um, each time I begin a piece, I think, oh my God. You know, really, really. I mean, I can often, like, I segue from one piece to another. I begin with a certain thing from the last piece and continue. But it's always incredibly difficult because, um, you know, you're always thinking, oh my God, is this going to be any good? I don't know. And also, on the other hand, um, one of the things that has become um, one of my driving forces is the research, you know, being inspired by, by reading a book or, you know, I go to a museum and I look at things and I get inspired. When I'm working on a piece, like in Mirage, when I was working on Mirage, I would walk down the street, I saw the hopscotch by children, you know, children, you, I put it in the piece, you know, that's just part of our culture. And so, and it became part of the piece. So I think of my brain as like a computer, and we all have, I mean, we all have a, brain is a computer. And um, what I do is I put things into the computer and then I let it run around and interact. You know, your brain just does it for you. It's the way you put things into the computer and then you move them around. And um, so there's a natural process in a way. Uh, but, and so you lay awake at night and you, like some problems you can't solve and you lay awake all night and you solve the problem at night. You know, there are problems that you set up for yourself. And so that sort of explains it a little bit. I don't know, does that help? So you just have to go for it. Hi, hi Joanne. Uh, thank you for your presentation and thank you for your sharing about your artwork and your life. And uh, my question is, how is performing on a screen different from performing in front of a screen? And I mean, uh, in most of your performance, we can see both of them at the same time. And so what's your uh, intention and what are you thinking when you're performing uh, in front of a screen? All right, so I'll just begin by saying that um, I cannot sit outside and see my performances. But when I'm working on a performance, I step in and out of the performance space continuously, looking at what I'm doing, recording what I'm doing, looking at it. and. Um, and in that way, I can see what's happening. I don't just throw it together. You know, I don't just improvise in front of the screen without knowing what I'm doing. I constantly um, take a distance and look at it. And, um, yeah, is that answering the question? Does that answer your question, or was there more? Sorry. But, you know, all my work, my performances are very choreographed. So, although I do, um, move a little more freely than some, say, actors in a play move. Um, I'm always moving, depending on the situation, in the same way that I did in that section the last time I did it, like with Jason when we worked together. So he's a jazz pianist. And what he does in, my, in relation to my work, which I've observed, that's why I talk about it, is he knows it sort of by heart. And he has little notations, but he knows it. And so each time, I've noticed over the years, when we've done a performance again and again, each time he does it, he adds a little dynamism to it. You know, it becomes the same piece, but, you know, a little different. And I can only say it like that, I can't put it in words. So I respond to that, but not radically changing the tasks that I've set up. I might move from one place to another in a different way. And then I look at the performance and I judge myself, you know. I can look at something and think, oh my God, what terrible. You know, and then I go back and try something else. Or I ask friends to come. I also ask my friends to come and see my rehearsals because sometimes it helps for people to, um, yeah, to give you a little tip. Like I have one friend, Sakina Gavin, who lives in the, she's the mother of the little girl. She's a great critic, 
And so I also use my friends as critics. Not use them, but ask them to be my critics. Yeah. Thank you. We might be out of, we're about 10 minutes over, but yeah. should we, if there, but it looks like there's one last question. Oh, okay. Uh, so in your performance, Moving Off the Land, you use a lot of like experiment with sound and acoustics. So I was wondering, um, so using sound as acoustics and in juxtaposition with visuals of different sea creatures. Um, so also in the clip that you showed um, where you were like ringing bells behind, like in front of a screen. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about like the notion of interspatiality and space making using sound and acoustics as tools to address the issue of climate crisis? She's wondering if you could address the issue of the, the way in which you think about uh, interspe interspeciality or communication between species as a way of addressing the climate crisis in your work. Yeah. Well, I only think of it as um, something when I began working on moving off the land, um, like I would do a performance and no one knew in the audience, very few people would know that we actually came from the sea. We're made of the same material as the sea. There are many elements. Our elements of our body is the same as the seas. So people, I didn't know that until I started doing this research and a lot of people in the audience didn't know that. Um, they're just learning about interspecies communication. And so, since I began that piece, I noticed that more and more people are exploring it and writing about it. Probably have been doing so for a long time. But when they first recorded the sound of the whales, those heartbreaking songs that were recorded in the, I guess the 70s or the 60s, I don't know, do you know those sounds of the whale crying? Or singing, in a way. Um, you know, we'd never heard that before. And now, like David Gruber is exploring the sperm whale sounds, and it's a clicking sound that the sperm whale makes through his head. So they're just learning. These things are just being um, learned and experimented. There's very, it's very difficult. Like I have a dog. I know my dog talks to me. <laughs> and I'm sure many of you have animals that talk to you. And it's a, something that you develop. Uh, and interspecies communication, I wish that I, I don't know how to, if that's your question, but, um, of course, it, influence, it interests me. But what was it about sound? Um, oh, you were asking about the use of bells in the performance? Yeah, so like you were using bells and then like different pitches of sound with the visuals of the sea creatures. And I was wondering if there is something like uh, significant about that. What was the question? Did the, I guess, did the bells uh, give you a kind of way of communicating with these other forms of life? No. <laughs> um, I've used sound from the very beginning and I use instruments and I never thought of it as communicating. I com they communicate to other, you know, of course, you as humans. Uh, I mean, dogs communicate with sound and you can, you know, um, communicate with your dog with your voice. But I don't pretend to know very much or experience very much about that, but um, I've been using sounds like the bells forever and f from the very beginning. And I work with composers, for instance, the way I work, I'll just say, I don't know how to answer your question, but the way I work with, with Jason, the way we developed the sound was to work, um, to be inspired. So I would do a movement or I would have a text and he would play a tune or something. And then I'd say, yes, I like it or I don't like it. And then I would be inspired to move in a, different, a certain way by his music. And he would be inspired by what I was doing. So in that way, there's an exchange between the composer and the um, performer or the artist. The same way with Ikoe Mori. You know, I show her the material. And with her, it's less of a process in that way because I just let her play, I mean, I don't let her play, but she plays in the context of the piece. And bells are just one of my instruments. 
always. And I, I never thought of them communicating. Maybe the animals wouldn't like that sound. You know, um, they have sensitive ears. And so I think the sound, there's a lot of research going on now about sound in the oceans that are bad for the uh, whales, bad for the fish, bad for everything. They're destroying them. You know, the sound that machines make. Uh, there's a lot of bad sounds out there that are uh, one of the problems. So I don't, I'm not sure how to, you know, there's certainly no interspecies communication going on there. And in order to do that, you have to have a very silent situation. In order to hear the sounds um, in the ocean, you have to have silence. You can't hear them unless, um, you can't even as a diver go down with a bubbling thing on your back and hear. You know, you have to do free diving. So I'm just talking about the ocean. It's very dangerous and, and also only a few people can do that and a few courageous people. Anyway, I don't know how. I, I just wanted to thank you for sharing your good sounds with us uh, today and also for trying to communicate. <laughs> no, I'm sorry that I can't understand almost anything that you're saying in the microphone with your masks on. So that's why I had to keep asking. So maybe I could have answered a little bit better if I'd been able to um, understand. Well, it's a great um, exercise in listening, too. So thank you so much. And thank you also to the audience. Thank you. Thank you.